Good morning. Welcome to Castle Methodist here in the garrison town of Colchester. Our service today will be led by our worship leaders and friends, Jan, Jane, Chris, Clive, Jeff and Barbara. Greetings to all those who will join us online or will be listening to this service later in the week. You're always in our thoughts. Now a few moments of quiet before we start the service. Come and join the body of Christ. Come whether you are weak or strong. Come whether you are suffering or rejoicing. Come whether you feel oppressed or free. All are welcome here. Side by side, hand in hand, we all stand together in the body of Christ. Let us pray. Just as we are, Lord, we gather in your presence. Help us to be the body of Christ in this place, to stand together with our neighbours, to bring the good news to the poor, to help set the oppressed free. In your strength and in your name we pray. Amen. And now we're going to sing our first hymn, which is number 664 from Singing the Faith, Lord, you call us to your service. Let us pray. A prayer of adoration. God of heaven and earth, we kneel in adoration before the mystery made manifest in your Son. Jesus stood with us as one of us, so we stand with one another in adoring you. 
by living the way of love and life he showed us, setting us free to serve in the fullness of your grace. A prayer of confession and assurance of forgiveness. Lord, we confess that we tend to see our calling as individual. What would you have me do, we ask? Where might I be best used? And of course, that's part of our calling, for you see us as individuals. We're also called to stand alongside one another in our service, and sometimes we forget this. But you, Father, always see the bigger picture. Forgive us for being so caught up in our own spheres that we fail to see the need to stand with our brothers and sisters, to serve together in advancing your kingdom. And a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. We praise you for the freedom we take for granted, the freedom to serve you every day of our lives, openly and without being challenged. We give so little thought to this freedom that sometimes we fail to exercise it. So we thank you, Lord, for every opportunity that comes our way to be your hands, your eyes, your heart in this world, to do your will, to see things as you do, to share your love. We praise you that in serving, we stand alongside our sisters and brothers in Christ in a ministry stretching down the generations from Jesus himself. All thanks and praise be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We, we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Give us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Now, I want to tell you a story, but will you all come up and sit here so that I can see you when I talk to you? Some more seats here. That's it. Come on. Come on. The more people I have to talk to, the better, hmm? <laughs> I want to tell you the story of a boy called Nathaniel. He looked like that. That isn't him, of course. He lived in the same village as Jesus. And he was a friend of Jesus. He grew up in the village with Jesus. And he played with Jesus. So he knew Jesus quite well but not very well, because Jesus was a bit inclined not always to play with the others, because he was in the synagogue learning about God and, and the ways to serve him. Don't get over-impressed by synagogue. Um, we think it looked like this. That's supposed to be the remains of the outside of the synagogue. It doesn't look very smart, does it? But don't forget, this was only a little tiny village, so they probably didn't have a very smart synagogue. But there was room inside for them all to sit. Um, and there we are, it's a different picture, but they would sit on, on the ground with the men at the front and the ladies at the back when they had their service. Well, the Sunday, the, the, the uh, service I want to tell you about was a rather particular one, and they were all gathered in the synagogue and Jesus wasn't there. Well, that wasn't entirely strange because Jesus hadn't been seen for a month or more in the village and they all wondered where he'd gone. Where can he be, they thought. 
and there was rumors that he was out in the countryside, uh, wandering around, uh, all on his own, uh, and gone perhaps a little bit peculiar, they didn't quite sure. But anyway, this particular Sunday, they were all sat there waiting for the service, to, and Jesus walked in. Well, there was a surprise. They didn't know he was coming back that Sunday, but anyway, he came in, uh, and they sat down, and they started the service, and then when it got to the reading, Jesus walked, uh, stood up and said, I want to do the reading this morning. So they were, oh, 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 well, okay, yeah, okay, you can do the reading this morning. And he chose a piece of, of reading from the Old Testament from the prophet of Isaiah. And it said this. Can you read it for us? Thanks. That was a surprise, wasn't it? Because you weren't expecting to do that. Well, that was a surprise for the people in the synagogue as well. Now is God's time for everyone. Well, you wouldn't believe it. But all the men in the synagogue said, hey, 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 you can't say that in here. You can't say that you have been part of God, that you've been sent by God. Um, that's, you can't say that in the synagogue. Um, oh, no, 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 no. And then when he went on at the end to say that the message he was going to give was for everyone, well, that was just too much. Because they thought they were special and that God's message was only going to be for them and not for everyone. No, 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 that won't do. Get out, get out, get out, they all said to him. And they pushed Jesus out of the synagogue and they were going to send him out away from the village. Nathaniel went out uh, and watched what was going on. And another surprise. Instead of walking away, Jesus turned round and he walked through all the men who were wanting to push him out and he started to walk on through the village. Um, well, Nathaniel didn't quite know what to make of that. How had that happened? But as he walked by, Jesus looked at Nathaniel straight in the eye. as if he was saying to Nathaniel, you believe in me, you believe that I could do this, don't you? Well, Nathaniel didn't quite know what to make of that, but anyway, he thought about it. Jesus went on the way. And it so happened, a bit later on, uh, that Nathaniel thought about that again, because he came up with Jesus later on, some, uh, that's another story, and I'll have to tell you that on another occasion. Because Jesus walked out of the village knowing that the Spirit of God was with him. He was walking in the, in the light, light of God <coughs> because he knew that God was with him. He was, he, Jesus knew that he was going to walk with the love of God to do lovely things. And he knew then that the life that Jesus was living was the life of God. Now, that couldn't have happened in that village because they didn't accept Jesus. No, 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 get out, they said, get out. And Jesus had walked away because though all those things that Jesus could do can only happen to those who believe in him and who try and follow him. And the message is the same today. If you believe in Jesus, in what Jesus says, and what Jesus can do, then you can live the life exactly the same. You can see life with the light of God. You can walk through life loving people with the love of God. And then you know that you are living the life of God. Okay. Now, I don't want you to just get up and scrabble back to your table at the back there, which I know you do sometimes because I've seen you doing it. We're going to stand up and we're going to march back to your table. I'll march with you um, and uh, you can, the adults can sing and you can sing as well. We are marching in the light of God because 
You can walk high, you can march from that there, because you are important people in this church and in this place. And you don't have to worry about scrabbling round to the back. We like to see you, you're important. We're going to get up and we're going to march out there uh, to those words. I don't expect that the grown-ups will march to you. No, I thought not. But if you watch, you might see them actually doing this with their feet while they're singing, if they really get carried away. Let, let's, let's, let's stand up and get ready to, to march. Are you ready to march? We'll see. May the Lord be with the children. We're now going to read our psalm, which is Psalm 19, and I would ask you to respond in the red type, please. <clears throat> the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. One day pours out its song to another, and one night unfolds knowledge to another. They have neither speech nor language, and their voices are not heard. Yet their sound has gone out into all lands, and their words to the ends of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, that comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber, and rejoices as a champion to run his course. It goes forth from the end of the heavens, and runs to the very end again, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and gives light to the poor. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous to good. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey dripping from the honeycomb. By them also is your servant taught, and in keeping them there is a great reward. Who can tell how often they offend? O oh, cleanse me from my secret fault. Keep your servant also from presumptuous sins, lest they get dominion over me. So shall I be undefiled and innocent of great offence. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.
The next lesson is taken from the first book of Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 12 to 31. One body, many parts. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honourable we treat with special honour, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. Thanks be to God. Slower than butterflies, Eddie Astu tells the following story of an event which happened to him in his life, which he feels illustrates that reading. I waited impatiently for the winter to turn to spring and produce a warm sunny day. I drove to the small airfield and there on the grass was a glittering silver two-seater glider. It was beautiful. A long sleek body with even longer slim wings. My instructor and I 
talked while he checked the aircraft. That seemed a good idea. The next bit I didn't like. He strapped a parachute harness on me and told me how to pull the cord if I should need to. The next bit I liked even less as I shoehorned myself into the forward seat. He strapped me in tight, tighter than tight, a harness over my shoulders, another across my lap, both locked together in the middle. I could move my head, my arms and legs, but my body was immobile, fastened close to the seat. I felt trapped. Once we were airborne though, and free from the towing plane, I understood. You become one with the glider. You move as part of it, and not independently. When the b glider banks, you move with it. Everything it does, you do. You're not sitting in a machine that flies. You're actually flying. You're an integral part of it. It's the discipline which eventually adds to the experience, makes the enjoyment more intense. In a very real sense, one is part of the body. Not metaphorically, but organically, and totally dependent on the pilot with, with you. I wouldn't want to, to have been freed from him or the glider. I was happy being one part of the whole and enjoying everything that happened. We're now going to sing again from Singing the Faith 611, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
Our Gospel reading comes from Luke 4, beginning to read at the 14th verse, but actually going on until verse 30, not 14. Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everybody praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of the whole synagogue was fastened on him. He began saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke of him well and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this prophet to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what you have heard that you do in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked back right through the crowd and went on his way. Thanks be to God for his reading. Amen. I want to share with you a meditation written by Nick Fawcett from his book No Ordinary Man. He had a wonderful voice, a real joy to listen to, so clear, so deep, so nicely spoken. I felt I could have sat there all day letting the words wash over me. Good news for the poor, release for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind. Familiar, comfortable, reassuring words. Or so I'd always thought. Only this time they didn't sound quite as reassuring as they used to. I don't know what it was, but somehow, as he spoke, they came to life, possessed of a power they had never held before, as if I were hearing them for the very first time. Only the prophet was speaking, not to people long ago, but to me, here, now. And suddenly I didn't want to hear, didn't want to listen anymore, for the words no, were no longer what I'd thought they were, but unexpected, discomforting, troubling words. They leapt at me and pinned me down, 
They lunged at me, piercing my very soul. They left me anxious, guilty, fearful, asking what they meant to someone like me, who was neither poor nor blind, but rich and free. I closed my eyes, but still he spoke. And listening again, despite myself, I heard him say, a prophet is without honour in his own country. That was the end, too much. The voice no longer seeming beautiful, but strident, no longer bringing joy, but rousing rage. For I realised this man came not to soothe, but to challenge, not to praise, but to question, not only to us, but to others. I rose in rage, cursing him for his blasphemy, calling for his death. Yet somehow, though all around me did the same, he walked straight by, unharmed, untouched. Don't ask me how, for I just don't know. But what I do know, deep down, much though I try to deny it, much though I try to ignore it, is that Jesus had been right to say, these words have been fulfilled today. And now we're going to sing our next hymn, which is number 685 from Songs of Fellowship. Christ is the world in which we move.
And now, some thoughts on today's readings from Ruth's. The scene we heard about in Luke's Gospel has sometimes been called Jesus' mission statement or manifesto. Using lines from Isaiah that place the poor and the oppressed front and centre, Jesus declares to the people of his home village, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It is a truly bravura moment. Imagine reading such a bold piece of scripture here at Castle, among people you have known for a very long time, and saying, well, folks, today the promise contained in these words has come to its fulfillment. It would almost certainly cause some strong reactions from disbelief, surprise, through to shock, and perhaps mockery. Two things leap out of this starting point for Jesus, adult ministry. Firstly, Jesus' imaginative vision. This is the prophetic boldness to discern that in that moment in his home synagogue, that God's reign is to be declared. For the fact is that for many in the Roman controlled state of Galilee of Jesus' time, it would have been challenging to picture God's abundance coming to set his people free. The second thing is related. Jesus' declaration of purpose was a call to his hearers to join a new community. Just as Isaiah of old had been speaking to people in new hope and promise, so was Jesus. The work of God's kingdom was not simply about the Messiah. It is an invitation to all to stand together and get involved. In the reading from Corinthians, there is a beautiful, profound simplicity in Paul's use of the body as an image of what it means to be part of the body of Christ. We are all equally important. Some of us may already know that we're important. Maybe we've had a childhood and education that helped us to be confident of our own worth. Perhaps we have a recognized status in our communities as a leader, an influencer, a minister, or whatever it is. But not everyone feels like that. Many of us may feel unimportant and not particularly valuable. Perhaps we are young, black, poor, disabled, female, mentally distressed. Maybe we are homeless or refugees. Perhaps we struggle with addiction or have been abused or imprisoned. How extraordinary and powerful it is then to hear Paul's confident assertion that we are actually indispensable and will be treated with greater honor and respect. How affirming and strengthening does that feel? Jesus makes clear that the weaker members of the body are those he has come to help. If we are poor, he will bring us good news. If we are imprisoned, he will release us. If we are blind, he will restore our sight. And if we are oppressed, he will set us free. But what does this actually mean? How does this liberation happen? Oscar Romero showed us one way. As the Roman Catholic Archbishop of El Salvador, although from a humble background himself, his role put him on a par with the rich ruling elite. This was in the 1970s and 80s, a time when there was a massive inequality between the rich and land-owning minority and the poor majority in South America. Worker priests exploring the meaning of Bible passages such as today's readings were teaching a gospel that had a bias to the poor and challenged the government to reform. Archbishop Romero was dramatically converted to this view 
when his friend and fellow priest, Father Rutilo Grande, was murdered by the security forces for his activism with the poor. Romero began to teach what is now known as liberation theology. And he explains it like this. A building is on fire and you are watching it burn, standing and wondering if everyone is safe. But then someone tells you that your mother and your sister are inside that building. Your attitude changes completely. You're frantic. Your mother and sister are burning and you'd do anything to rescue them, even at the cost of getting charred. And that's what it really means to be truly committed. If we look at poverty from the outside, as if we were looking at a fire, that's not to opt for the poor. No matter how concerned we may be, we should get inside as if our own family were burning. Indeed, it's Christ who is there, hungry and suffering. And this is the challenge for us today, to get inside poverty and oppression as though it were our family. Indeed, Christ who is suffering and that would demonstrate our bias to the poor. Jesus shocked his home village by saying that God's message of love, freedom and good news is just as much for outsiders. And it's an uncomfortable message for them. They were so angry to hear it that they drove Jesus out. Sometimes the voices we need to hear do have disquieting messages that we don't want to listen to the child abuse victims that keep reminding the church it needs to address its shameful past, the people that still face discrimination, including from some Christians, women and children who have been raped, exploited or trafficked, challenging us to address gender violence and the marginalization of women that feeds it. The black people highlighting the racism and discrimination in British society, including our churches. Do we listen to them? Do we hear them and respond? A disadvantage of the modern media and social media age may be the sheer amount of information that we have to deal with. But at the same time, it can be an advantage. For example, when we find out things that might, in a previous age, have been hidden, or that certain important people haven't told the truth. And sometimes important truths come from the people we don't normally listen to. How many parents really listen to their children? How many teenagers complain, you never listen to me? Yet, aged only 15, Greta Thunberg started a movement for climate change that has inspired millions of people to get involved in action to save the planet. Malala Yousafzai, the teenager from Pakistan who was shot by the Taliban for campaigning for girls' rights to education, was awarded the Nobel Prize at just under 17 years old for the same work. And in March 2020, 23-year-old England and Manchester United footballer Marcus Rashford started working with the food charity Fair Share, raising over £20 million to combat food poverty in the UK and inspiring thousands to join in a campaign that forced a change in government policy on free school meals. Like Jeremiah, what they had to say was so important that people listened. So, we should be encouraged that if what we have to say needs saying, even if we feel no one will listen to us, it's still worth saying. We are also challenged to speak with outsiders that we don't normally meet, ex-prisoners who've committed crimes that make them monsters in our eyes, refugees, who we think should take second place to our own people. Those excluded by the stigma of serious mental health issues. Homeless people battling with addiction and abuse. 
Jesus is clear that the good news is for all of them. How are we reaching out in love to people who are not like us? We come to our prayers of intercession. These are general, but I'm sure we can all think of particular examples in our world today. God of the living, of the present moment, your word contains truth for each new generation. We pray for fresh and exciting reminders of the power and glory of your sovereign love. Speak to us a new living God of your concern for justice for the poor and oppressed. Help us to announce your good news, to proclaim your liberty to those held captive, to work and pray for a better world. This is our prayer. Speak to us a new living God of the ways in which you want us to live. Help us to share the hope we have in you to proclaim your love for every individual, to work and pray for new life for humankind. This is our prayer. Speak to us a new living God of our calling as members of Christ's body. Help us to be united in love and respect for one another, to proclaim your salvation to the world, to work and pray under the guidance of your spirit. This is our prayer. We make our prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who brought new life to old words and to old ways of living, who announced the good news of our salvation. Amen. And we are within the week of prayer for Christian unity, and so the collect for that week. Lord, we thank you for calling us into the company of those who trust in Christ and seek to obey his will. May your spirit guide and strengthen us in mission and service to your world, for we are strangers no longer, but pilgrims together on the way to your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Our final hymn is number 364 from Singing the Faith. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
God, you call us to be the body of Christ in this place. Side by side, hand in hand, help us to stand together, to stand with our neighbours, to break free from all that holds us back, from making the world as you want it to be. In Jesus' name, amen.